30 Minutes with Ron. Hello, my name's Ron Gagliardi. I'm the ghost of this show. I like to say host sometimes, but every so often I say ghost. I'm the host of the 30 Minutes with Ron show. I just want to point out that this evening, a sniffle of germs has inhabited my body. So if my voice goes out, it's not the equipment. I would like to introduce my guest for the evening. His name is Dr. Charles Dimmick. Good evening. Yes, he is a professor emeritus of geology from Central Connecticut State University, right? That is correct. Excellent. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we are going to be talking tonight about the geology of Connecticut. Here it is. <laughs> Dr. Dimmick has been kind enough to bring this map in. And I think probably a good idea would be to explain what we're looking at, because there's all this wonderful color. And I don't think too many people have ever seen a map with such glorious color on it of Connecticut. Well, and also the confusion of it. I hadn't mentioned it before to you, but this map took 150 years, roughly, to put together. This was published in 1985. The first attempt to get a geologic map of Connecticut was back around 1835. Mm -hmm. And the more they tried, the more problems they had, because the geology of Connecticut was far more complex than anyone had any idea when they started. Oh. And so finally, John Rogers at Yale declared in 1985 he finally had something that was worthy of full publication in full color. So it's probably expensive. You can get a copy at the uh, Department of Environmental Protection for a reasonable amount. Reasonable. Reason okay, so mm -hmm. what does, what does, I'm sure this key tells us all kinds of wonderful things. Give us, give us a sample of what's going on that's important to our conversation this evening. Okay, I'm going to point out a, a, a few things here. One of the things that was the greatest complication is that these rocks down here, which show a pattern and color completely different than everything else, didn't match anything else when people started matching rocks in Connecticut. Okay. And it turns out it's because they don't belong to us. And who do they belong to? Africa. Ah, who it, knew? Who knew? The, these rocks just didn't match. And so that's part of what took the longest time, and it wasn't until we got to continental drift and plate tectonics that we got an explanation that made sense that allowed us to figure out that ancestral North America is over here. Okay. This is a piece of ancestral Africa over here. So you see that line that kind of outlines that. Yep. And they were originally separated by thousands of miles. And sometime uh, in the interval between about 350 and 450 million years ago, the ocean that was between the two of them got squeezed out of existence by plate tectonics. The nerve. And so everything from here to here represents old ocean bottom that got squeezed. Uh-huh. Interesting. Then we have a later feature. You'll notice something that's almost straight line going down the middle, the stuff yep. that's mostly light yellow and then uh, reddish colors in between. And that's a result of the beginning of forming our present ocean, the one we call the Atlantic, which didn't okay. exist back then. It started to split open about 200 million years ago. And when it did, most of a tore where the Atlantic is now, but part of North America started to tear right there. So that's an old wound. Okay. As the Atlantic started to open, part of Connecticut started to open also, and that piece dropped down and then got filled in. And then luckily, the Atlantic formed where it did, not here, or we'd have a completely different situation. Yes. So now when we talk about ripped and things, this is like over millions of years. This is over millions yeah. of years. This coastline, when this was the coastline of North America, that's about 550 million years. I'm rounding things yeah. off. And it was tropical, and it was at a different angle. North was that direction. This was a south-facing beach that was actually a little south of the present equator. There's been a lot of things <laughs> happened yes. since then. Okay. And over time, it rotated like this and moved like this. And there it is. 450 million years ago, the 
old ocean, which we call the Eopetus, started to close. And as it started to close, we had a bunch of volcanic islands build up in the Eopetus, kind of like the Japanese islands now. Mm -hmm. As it continued to close, those islands got shoved up onto North America. A hundred million years later, the rest of the ocean closed, and this piece over there that I had referred to right. came crashing, well, crashing at the rate of four or five inches a year, yeah. if you can call that crashing, crashing, into North America, squeezed out the old Eopetus Ocean and gave us uh, essentially what we have today, except for the basin down the middle, which was about 200 million years ago. Okay. So it was a very complex history, and it's no wonder it took 150 years for geologists to figure this out. Yeah, all right. I mm -hmm. can tell you one thing you may never have heard before. Yes. Whenever I see this map again, and I've seen it at two or three of your lectures, I'm going to remember that this is part of virginally Africa because this looks like the profile in the Lion King of a lion. There's okay. the nose over there. That's so it. I will always remember that as part of Africa because of that. <laughs> and no one else will tell you that. Mm -hmm. All right, so these colors represent different kinds of rock. Different kinds of rock. The color is mostly age connected. Okay. And the key, we'll show this again, that you asked about down in here. Yep. Uh, color coordinates the age of the rocks, oldest on the bottom. Uh, and you've got to be a little careful because the camera can't really pick up these little rectangles which show you the actual colors of the different rocks. Yep. But uh, the age and also the type of rock. Okay. So uh, the most important part is that the oldest rocks are being shown in these pink and brown colors. Okay. And successively younger rocks uh, in somewhat a, a different spectrum of colors. And then finally the rocks in the Connecticut Valley here in the uh, very light pink and the uh, yellow. The red represents intrusions of igneous material. Okay, now I remember from my geography class in college, that had to, college, <laughs> the voice is going, that had to do with heat. That had to do with heat and it had to do with the fact that with this youngest stage, uh, Connecticut was starting to split open. As it started to split open, it reduced pressure and rock deeply buried was able to melt and force its way up into the Connecticut Valley and produced huge lava flows. And so most of the broader portions of these are the exposed edges of the huge lava flows that uh, came up. There's the Hanging Hills in Meriden, yep. uh, uh, for instance. The skinnier red lines represent dikes, that is to say the cracks in the earth uh, as the molten rock came up, the part that didn't get all the way to the surface formed dikes of material, almost vertical uh, fillings of the uh, feeder uh, channels okay. that produce the lava flows. And we have a famous set right here in uh, Cheshire. Again, it's very faint right on this map, but there's a north-south red line and an east-west red line go through there. We call that the cross dikes because it represents a feeder dike running north-south uh, that was cut through a feeder dike running east-west. And the okay. east-west dike is older, the north-south dike is younger because the north-south dike, when you get there, you can see has cut across the other dike. And where is this in Cheshire? That is on Boulder Road near the south end of Cheshire. Uh, if you know where Boulder Knoll Farms uh, is, yep. this is uh, a few hundred yards east of Boulder uh, Knoll Farms. And uh, you can still go there today and see this. It might need someone to give you a little guidance to Probably. see what it is you're looking at, but yeah. it's there. Interesting. Now, mm -hmm. when I hear lava, mm -hmm. I think volcanoes. 
Yeah. Was this volcanic or was this some other process that made the, the rock melt? We got a technical problem. Uh -oh. It's a volcanic, but there was no volcano. Ah. It was a f what we call fissure flows. It's the same kind of volcanic output that formed the great Columbia River basalts out in uh, Washington and Oregon State, where you have thousands of square miles covered with great lava sheets that came up through the same thing, came mm -hmm. up through fissures. So you didn't have a central volcano. You just had long cracks. The cracks went f all the way from what's now under Long Island Sound, which wasn't there at the time, all the way up into northern Massachusetts. Extremely long and lava pouring, or molten rock pouring out its lava once it reaches the surface through that entire length. Terrific volumes, hundreds of square miles of material all coming out in a relatively short time. Interesting. So I've learned that you can have lava without a volcano. Who right. knew? <laughs> you knew. I didn't know. Yeah. All right, so in Cheshire, Mm -hmm. um, we have a couple of things that I've noticed and that other folks have noticed. We have the 691 cut through. Yes. And there's some reddish rock there, and it seems to be on a certain angle. And I understand that that's something that people come to look at who are into geology. The whole Connecticut Valley is full of these sediments that filled in the, the, the uh, basin. When Connecticut started to split apart and the central part, the Connecticut Valley started to sink, then the rocks on either side were being eroded, and so the central basin filled in over several millions of years, every once in a while interrupted by a lava flow covering everything, and then it started to fill in again. Yep. But the eastern side dropped down much faster than the western side here. And so over in the eastern side, you've got 20,000 feet or more thickness of sediment. If you drill a hole over uh, in Glastonbury or Portland, you go down through 20,000 feet of sediment before you got to the bottom of all this. Mm. Over in the western side, you go through maybe 2,000 feet. So what happened, because the eastern side was sinking faster, everything slopes yep. to the east. It was laid down horizontal, but it got tilted. And so that's why you see them that way. Huh. And that 691 cut goes through these, were essentially floodplain deposits because we were above the sea at that point. Okay. And floodplain deposits have sands and they have silts and they have mudstones. And 691, you could even tell uh, that the uh, floodplains were vegetated because you can find the paths of the tree roots. You can't find the trees anymore, but where the trees uh, huh. rooted down in there, they left channels which later filled in with other material. You, you get root casts uh, right through uh, uh, that area. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, I was, what I've learned was that the term arcosal is in here. Is that the correct term? Yeah, it, arcosic. Arcosic. The, we, we, the sandstones are called arcosic, meaning they have a lot of feldspar in them. Mm -hmm. now, you know, if you take beach sand in Florida, it's almost pure quartz sand. Yep. Uh, feldspar uh, when you get a chunk of granite, a chunk of granite is about three-fourths feldspar and one-fourth quartz. Just, I'm taking great liberties in the percentages, but yeah. to give you an idea there. But the feldspar weathers uh, to clay minerals given enough time. And so by the time sand gets down to Florida, all the feldspar is weathered out and you get nothing but quartz. This was fresh material from eastern and western Connecticut having been lifted up all washed short distance into the Connecticut Valley, and so it still had a lot of feldspar in it. Okay. And that's what makes it an arcosic sandstone. Arcosic means it's full of feldspar. I never knew that. Okay. You have so much knowledge. I can't help it. I have a garbage-filled mind. It's full of these trivia things like that. All these good terms. <laughs> yeah. Now, there also had been a discovery in Cheshire of a skull of a dinosaur. A paleontologist had been, I don't know, traveling on 691. He uh, pulled his car off to take a little rest, and he saw this little white thing glinting in, in the red, and he went over to look at it, and it was a skull of a dinosaur. Tell us about that, because you know more than I do about it. I, I do. Uh, it was, uh, there's a couple of tales on it, but it was a geologist who, uh, from... A geologist. It was a geologist from uh, New Jersey that originally found it. Mm -hmm. And the exact locality is not being given out because they don't right. want a bunch of people out there digging. Right. 
uh, but it, it was a skull of uh, an early Jurassic dinosaur. Now it was small from what it I it was yeah. small. Yeah. It was very primitive compared to uh, later dinosaurs, and it's only one of two skulls found in Connecticut. Connecticut's full of dinosaur footprints all over the place. Oh yeah, I've I've found I don't know how many places I found the, the footprints myself, but there's only been seven bone finds. Uh, including this skull and then a partial skull up, I think somewhere up uh, in Mansfield, but I can't mm -hmm. be sure that I remember correctly. So actual bone is very rare. Right. Uh, now you told me that it's not really bone bone, but it's fossilized bone. It's fossilized bone. The bone material has been uh, filled in with mineral matter of various kinds, which helps preserve it. Right. So fossilized bone is heavier than ordinary bone. It hasn't been petrified, as some people talk about petrified wood. It's been, but it's been infused with mineral salts that helps preserve it. Okay, so that's different than a fossil. A fossil just means any evidence of ancient life that gives you something of the anatomy of the, of the ancient life. And fossils can be many, many different uh, kinds of things. You could have, uh, in a sense, a dinosaur footprint is a fossil because you have evidence of what the bottom of the foot looked like. Right. So that makes it a, a fossil. A fossil could be uh, almost complete uh, preserved remains like the mammoths frozen in the uh, tundra. Mm -hmm. Or, so that's from one extreme to another, an impression all the way to uh, the completely preserved material. All right. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit more about Cheshire. Mm -hmm. uh, some years ago, I was reading someplace, and I came across the term drumlin. And the person who was talking about this said that Cheshire is built on a drumlin, which I think at the time was said that something about a, a, a spoon with a belly and then going downhill. <laughs> and I, I mentioned this to you, and you said, no, Cheshire's not on a drumlin. What, are you crazy? How yep. did that happen? How did that thing get to be wrong? Uh, well, I, I think as much as anything else, drumlins are the most familiar type of glacial form that people have learned about who haven't really taken any geology courses. It, uh, so a, a drumlin is a landform caused by glaciers having dropped glacial till and then riding back over the till they dropped and streamlining it. Ah. And till there, is the remnants of till yeah. is whatever the glacier was carrying uh, is left behind. Some of it is unsorted glacial till, which is what most of what we have here in Cheshire. It, it's everything from boulder to clay all mixed together. Mm -hmm. And then there's glacial outwash, which is the meltwater coming from the glacier and then sorting the stuff out into different sizes. So we have sand deposits in Cheshire, there are glacial delta deposits from the meltwaters. Okay. And they don't look at anything like the till because it's all material about the same size. So we, we have both of them in, in uh, all over Connecticut mm -hmm. and in Cheshire itself. And uh, some places the till has been shaped a little bit, but I don't think we've got an actual drumlin anywhere in Cheshire. Okay. New Britain now is full of drumlins. Uh, Walnut Hill in New Britain is a drumlin, for instance. Okay. So we have some good drumlins in the Connecticut Valley, but Cheshire isn't exactly known exactly. for having but it drumlins. But it is a bulge and then going downhill from it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, uh, if the spoon analogy is not bad. They're usually a little blunt on the northern end and tapered out on the southern end as the glacier pushed on this stuff. And so the, the northern end gets kind of a shoved appearance, and then the southern end tails out uh, and, and uh, has a gentler slope. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. now there's something else about glaciers that we have in Cheshire, mm -hmm. and those are called the erratics. Glacial erratics. And I used to think that they were kind of dragged along, but at one of your talks you mentioned that they might have been like a thousand feet up in the air on the surface of the glacier. And yeah, the, gla the, the glacial erratics normally don't show any sign of being abraded or eroded, mm -hmm. which means they weren't on the bottom. They could drop onto the ice as the ice uh, could undermine something like the hanging hills. The ice coming by could undermine and pieces would drop off. Yep. 
and then carry along. And then as they go uh, generally southward, gradually they would work their way down to the bottom uh, of, of the ice, and then when the ice finally melted, they're left behind wherever they happen to be. Right. So they're boulders, and they're, there's some they're big boulders ones in Cheshire. And, and quite often uh, pretty angular chunks. Some of those we have in Cheshire still have lots of angles, particularly those that came from the Hanging Hills. Ah. Last time the ice advanced, actually it had two periods of advance, uh, the most recent ones. One of them was kind of from the north-northeast, and pieces of the Hanging Hill broke off and end up scattered across Cheshire. And then, so slightly earlier one, the ice was coming from the north-northwest, and we got pieces of Prospect and Walcott broke off and got carried and dumped into Cheshire. So they give you completely different looking glacial erratics when mm -hmm. you look at the stone. So the erratics are actually erratic. They're erratic, yes. They <laughs> Two different spelling, E-R and I-R. E-R-R-A-T-I-C, -R -R yeah. erratic, yes. Yes. I wanted to mention something. I wanted mm -hmm. to share something with our audience. You're hearing this for the first time here on 30 Minutes with Ron. I'm in the process of starting a museum of the history of glass, which when you take the initials, it's THOG, which is, I think, a wonderful name. I'm going to be Mr. Thoggy when I go out talking about this. <laughs> And something about the history of glass that a lot of people don't know is that nature makes glass. And there's three types that I know of, maybe you know of more. One is obsidian from volcanic stuff. One is fulgurites from lightning. And one is tektites, which is really hard to explain. Are we likely to have any fulgurites, tektites, or obsidian in Cheshire? Uh, probably not. First of all, most obsidian forms from lava that's relatively rich in silica. Okay. Our lava is relatively poor in silica. It's not the kind that forms obsidian. Uh, as far as fulgurites, we could have them, and they would have to be in those sandy places because fulgurites only occur when lightning hits uh, soil which is rather sandy. In fact, pure sand works better than anything else because uh, you're fusing it. Yep. But there again, I mentioned the, the quartz. The more quartz that's in the sand, the more likely it is for a fulgurite to form. Mm -hmm. And since our sand has all of these feldspar pieces in it, it doesn't fuse that easily. Darn. It doesn't mean there isn't some out there. Yep. I've never heard of one reported. Tektites, tektites are a result of a meteorite impact splashing some of the earth rock up into space where it, it melted and then cools and comes Come down, as, down as little tiny flying saucers. Yeah. And they can land anywhere. So it's possible. I have never heard of any found anywhere in Connecticut, but uh, it's possible that one could come up with some. I'm not going to rule it out. Okay, well, I just went on eBay today, and I bought some obsidian and some fulgurite and some tektite. So now we will soon have it here in Cheshire, but it won't be native to Cheshire. It won't be native to Cheshire. Right. That's like some of the uh, spear points I found in Cheshire that are made out of flint, yep. which we don't have in Connecticut. And the flint must have been imported from New York State Yes, I found a Native American point at Cheshire Park, uh -huh. and I had it identified by someone, and he said it came from some deposit up in New York State someplace. Yes, I've taken yeah. students to that place. There was a, there was a famous site up there uh, that the uh, Indians used to get their flint from, and they traded it all over the northeastern United States. It made mm -hmm. such good spear points. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, we're getting to about the three-minute point of the show, three minutes left, mm -hmm. and I want to make sure that there was, if there's something that you wanted to add, that you wanted to talk about, that I didn't leave it out. Uh, the only thing I wanted to add, and is connected with those cross dikes, is that when the magma melted rock came up and formed those cross dikes, there was a lot of other stuff with it. Mm -hmm. uh, extreme hot water with minerals dissolved in it. And those minerals left deposits that were valuable here in Cheshire. In the 19th century, we were the center of barite mining for the United States right here in Cheshire. Yes. Something like 160,000 tons of barite were mined here in Cheshire. And the barite is associated with those 
cross dikes. And I had brought with me tonight a sample of the barite, which uh, came from the mines at Jenny Hill, Jenny Hill yeah. Road. And this particular sample I brought because it also has a number of green nodules in it. They're a little hard to pick up here, here, and here. And those are samples of malachite, which is a copper ore. And while barite mining started in the 1830s here in Cheshire, copper mining got started much earlier. Nobody ever made any money off the copper mines, but there's a report of a mine back in 1670, not too far from Ginny Hill Road, mm -hmm. actually over towards Boulder Road, near where the cross dikes are. I think they filled two ships with copper, and they were sending them over to England or something, and they, they just got they washed over. They, they sunk. They, they, they yeah. sank yeah. with one of the owners on board. Ah. And so everything got abandoned. The owner left behind got in a fight with someone, and somebody got killed. and. Nobody knows the details. Right. And then in 1711, uh, John Parker, who owned a farm down in that area, I guess rediscovered the copper and started mining copper. And so we had copper mining from 1711 to about 1820 in Cheshire. Mm -hmm. And the biggest profit was selling shares in the mines. Nobody ever made any money off the actual mines themselves from the copper because the mines kept flooding uh, or the ore wasn't high, high enough grade by the time they got it to the market, yep. one thing or another. So there was a history connection from the geology, from the geologic history to the economic history of early mm -hmm. Cheshire. Now, I had heard uh, mm -hmm. that there was a copper mine where Copper Valley is now, Country Club and the road, and that they found a vein of silver that was never able to be exploited because the, the mine always flooded. And you told me what? I said that I have never heard of silver being found in any of the rocks in Cheshire. The closest we come to it is down the Cheshire Hand and Line where the North-South Cross Dyke crosses in okay. Hamden. There is some galena, which is a lead ore. Right. And that galena has an extremely tiny amount of silver in it. Okay. Not enough to make any money off it. In fact, there's not enough galena to make money off the lead either. All right, so we want to tell our, our viewing audience that you're not going to make any money on silver in Cheshire. <laughs> and on that, I would like to thank you for tuning in. I'd like to thank my guest, Dr. Charles Dimmick, and have a great day. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.